Well, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Kevin Keith? This case is the topic of a podcast by Kim Kardashian. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. It's quite brief. Move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Kevin Keith was born in Ohio on December 18, 1963. He grew up in the city of Crestline, which is about an hour and a half north of Columbus. Kevin has one brother named Charles. When Kevin was in high school, he played football. Eventually, he started selling drugs and was considered a non-violent offender. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. We go to February 13, 1994, in the town of Bucyrus, Ohio, which is 20 miles west of Crestline. 24-year-old Marichelle Chapman and four other people were in her apartment in the Bucyrus Estates apartment complex. Her boyfriend, Richard Warren, her four-year-old daughter, Marche, her seven-year-old cousin, Juanita Reeves, and her four-year-old cousin, Quentin Reeves. At about 8.45 p.m., her aunt, 39-year-old Linda Chapman, arrived to pick up Juanita and Quentin. So now six people were in this apartment. A few minutes after Linda arrived at the apartment, Richard Warren noticed a man standing outside the apartment door. The man started to walk away, but Richard opened the door before the man made it too far. The mysterious man asked for Linda. Linda went outside to speak with him. As Linda was talking to the man, Marichelle told Richard the full name of the man. But later, Richard only remembered his first name, Kevin. Marichelle also informed Richard that Kevin had been involved in a big drug bust. A short time later, Linda and the man entered the apartment. The mysterious man was wearing a turtleneck shirt, which he had pulled up and covering the bottom part of his face. The man asked for a drink of water. He never pulled the turtleneck down. He drank it through the shirt. After drinking the water, the man produced a 9mm semi-automatic pistol from a plastic bag and ordered everybody to get on the floor. Marichelle addressed the man by the name Kevin and asked him what he was doing. The man admonished her for using his first name and told her to be quiet. He said to her, well, you should have thought about this before your brother started ratting on people. Marichelle responded, well, my brother didn't rat on anybody, and even if he did, we didn't have anything to do with it. At about 9 p.m., the man opened fire. He shot all six people in the apartment. Marichelle, her daughter, and her aunt were killed. Her boyfriend, Richard Warren, and her two cousins were injured, but survived. Despite being shot several times, Richard managed to run to a nearby restaurant. After the shooting, a neighbor named Nancy Smathers witnessed someone she described as a large, stocky black man run to the parking lot and climb into a light-colored, medium-sized car. The man drove the vehicle away, but slid on the ice and crashed into a snowbank. When the driver exited the vehicle, Nancy noticed that the interior dome light and the light for the license plate were non-functional. The driver rocked the car back and forth for almost five minutes before he was able to free it. The police arrived on the scene after the man drove away. After investigating, the police came to believe that Kevin Keith was the shooter. In January 1994, the month before the shooting, Kevin had been arrested for selling crack cocaine. The police were able to make this arrest because of information that came from Marichal Chapman's brother, Rudell Chapman, who was a confidential informant. The police believed that Kevin was trying to get revenge against Rudell and did not care that he wasn't present in the apartment. Kevin was satisfied to shoot people related to Rudell. On February 15, 1994, just two days after the shooting, Kevin was arrested and charged with three counts of aggravated murder and three counts of attempted aggravated murder. 
On June 1, 1994, Kevin Keith was found guilty on all counts and sentenced to death. In September of 2010, his sentence was commuted by the governor to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Kevin has unsuccessfully appealed his case. At the time making this video, he remains in prison. Now moving to my analysis. A lot of attention is being brought to this case because he is the topic of a podcast by Kim Kardashian. She believes that Kevin is actually innocent and, of course, should be released from prison. Juanita and Quentin Reeves said that Kevin was the killer, and they claim that no one from Kim Kardashian's podcast reached out to them for comment. The podcast claimed that they did reach out for comment. I believe that Kim Kardashian's interest in this case puts Kevin in an unusual position because some may argue that she really isn't the best advocate. She's a controversial figure who has been criticized as becoming famous for doing absolutely nothing except posting images on social media. Fame always brings attention to a topic, but not always the right type of attention. In my opinion, as unusual as it may seem considering Kim's famous for nothing resume, she is probably a good advocate for Kevin Keith. I don't think he has a lot of people lining up outside the prison eager to help him. Kim has enough money to produce a high quality podcast that will attract a lot of attention. I know a lot of people are puzzled about Kim Kardashian's success, but now she is shifting attention from her own mysterious rise to prominence to a true crime mystery. At least she is using her notoriety for a noble purpose. All this, of course, would be academic if Kevin Keith was actually the killer. That's where the advocacy could become a bit awkward. This brings me to the next question. Was Kevin Keith actually guilty of the murders? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Kevin was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. The victims of the shooting were related to a man who provided information about Kevin to the police, again, Rudell Chapman. This gives Kevin a motive. Earlier on the day of the shooting, Kevin Keith was seen in the neighborhood carrying a plastic bag. Richard Warren indicated that Kevin pulled the gun out of a plastic bag. Richard said that his girlfriend told him the mysterious man in the apartment was named Kevin and was tied to a drug bust. Eight hours after the shooting, when he was being treated at the hospital for his multiple gunshot wounds, Richard wrote the name Kevin on a piece of paper. Later that day, when shown a photo array containing six suspects, Richard selected Kevin's image and said that he was 95% sure Kevin was the shooter. The neighbor, Nancy Smathers, who witnessed the man flee, said that she was 90% sure it was Kevin Keith. In the snowbank the gunman slid into during his escape, investigators were able to see an indentation, which was made by the front license plate of the vehicle. The numbers 043 were visible. This matched a 1982 Oldsmobile Omega, which was seized from Kevin's girlfriend, Melanie Davison. It was light-colored and medium size, which matched the vehicle described by Nancy Smathers. In addition to the indentation, investigators made a cast of the tire tread near the snowbank. The tire tread matched the brand of tires that had been purchased for that vehicle just six months prior to the murders. The car had been driven less than 3,000 miles by February 1994, when the murders occurred. The tires that were actually on the car when it was seized were different. They had been manufactured in January 1994, a month before the shooting. It seems as though someone changed the tires immediately after the murders. 24 cartridge cases were recovered from the crime scene. All of them had been fired from the same 9mm semi-automatic pistol. A case matching those cases was found on the sidewalk across from the entrance to a general electric plant where Kevin's other girlfriend, Zena Scott, worked. Kevin picked up Zena from that location at about 11 p.m. on the night of the murders. Just to be clear, Kevin had two girlfriends, Zena and Melanie. I guess he was a really popular guy. Moving to the exculpatory factors. No fibers, fingerprints, or blood evidence connected Kevin to the murders. Kevin claimed that on February 13, 1994, at about 6 p.m., he was with his girlfriend, Melanie, in Mansfield, Ohio, which is 28 miles east of Bucyrus. At about 8.45 p.m., 
which is about 15 minutes before the shooting occurred, Kevin and his girlfriend drove away from her residence. A neighbor named Judith Rogers witnessed them driving away. Kevin and his girlfriend drove to his aunt's residence in Crestline, arriving at about 9 p.m. The aunt and another person at the house said that Kevin was there. So this is when the shooting was occurring. This is about 25 minutes from where the shooting happened. Kevin went inside the residence and borrowed $5 from his uncle. At about 9.10 p.m., Kevin and Melanie left and went back to Melanie's residence, arriving at about 9.25 p.m. This appears to give Kevin an alibi. This covers not only the time when the shootings occurred, but a little bit before that and a little bit after it. Richard Warren ran to a restaurant after he was shot. He told four people that he didn't know who the gunman was. When Richard was in the hospital and wrote down the name Kevin on a piece of paper, the police may have mentioned the name Kevin to him before he wrote it down. Two days after Kevin was arrested, Juanita Reeves identified the killer as a friend of her father named Bruce. It's worth noting that her mother would later testify that Juanita called a number of people Bruce. A man named Rodney Melton allegedly told a confidential informant that he was paid $15,000 to harm the man responsible for the drug raids that occurred on January 21, 1994. Rudell Chapman was that informant. Rodney had a yellow Chevy Impala registered to him. The license plate contained the numbers 043. This matches the indentation in the snow. Rodney showed up at the crime scene after the police arrived and told them that 9mm cartridges were used in the attacks. In addition, Rodney had a brother named Bruce. Perhaps Juanita was really trying to identify Rodney when she said the name Bruce. The neighbor, Nancy Smathers, who witnessed the gunman fleeing, was not able to identify the driver the first two times the police interviewed her. She did not identify Kevin until over a month later after seeing him on the television news. Years after Kevin's conviction, it was discovered that a crime analyst who testified against him was biased and had essentially no credibility. For example, her co-workers thought she was racist and suffered from, quote, severe mental imbalance, unquote. This is the same crime analyst who connected the indentation in the snow to the license plate and the tire treads to the Oldsmobile Kevin had access to. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I think that Kevin Keith was guilty? I think that he was guilty in reality, but I do not think that he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There were multiple Brady violations in this case. That's when the prosecution fails to turn over exculpatory evidence to the defense. The crime analyst was biased and incompetent. There is a convincing alternate theory of the crime, and Kevin had an alibi. There is plenty of doubt, and much of it is reasonable. There is no single piece of evidence against Kevin Keith that cannot be effectively disputed in some way. Chances are, Kevin will remain in prison for the rest of his life because the system loves definitive verdicts. Even if somebody is falsely convicted, the courts are reluctant to infringe on that finality. Now moving to my final thoughts. When a horrible crime like this one is committed, there is a desperation to arrest the perpetrator right away. Once the suspect is in custody, the legal system works to prove that they did it. Investigators start to see a completed image of guilt instead of the actual difficult to interpret fragmented image. Just like the system yearns for finality, investigators demand clarity. Their minds fill in the gaps left by an absence of evidence to construct a guilty narrative. The irony is that the strong desire to accomplish finality and clarity denies the public certainty. The definitive conclusions which brought so much comfort initially have now vacated and only worry about false conviction remains. Those are my thoughts on the case of Kevin Keith. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching. You may have noticed that I'm wearing a Halloween shirt. I thought this was appropriate for a couple of reasons. One, at the time making this video, Halloween is fast approaching. And two, this video was tangentially connected to Kim Kardashian. Her career trajectory 
is frightening enough to be consistent with Halloween. So the shirt is good for two purposes there. Just thought I'd add that in case anyone was wondering. Thanks again. I'll talk to you soon.